So that's a good starting point for me to um, uh, introduce him. I'm really pleased to welcome um, Edward Simpson, um, who is a social anthropologist and he's the director of the South Asia Institute at SOAS. Um, um, uh, uh, Edward, um, um, as I have just mentioned, is the author of um, The Political Biography of an Earthquake on Aftermath and Amnesia in Gujarat. Uh, which he published in uh, 2013. And he's also the editor of various um, volumes. Um, uh, and I'm just going to read out a couple of them, uh, one of which is The Future of the Rural World, India's Villages, 1950 to 2015, um, and The Society and History of Gujarat Since 1800, which is a select bibliography of, of the English and European language uh, sources. And he's also edited with Aparna uh, Kapadia, The Idea of Gujarat, uh, History, Ethnography, and Texts. So you can clearly see that he's a scholar of um, uh, Gujarat. Um, but in this um, current project, uh, which is um, uh, funded by the European Research Council, he's been looking at infrastructure across um, uh, South Asia and he's been particularly interested in the relationship between infrastructure, automobility, and the global sustainability um, uh, agenda. So this is a talk that will take us to, um, not Gujarat, but Madhya Pradesh, if I'm um, not mistaken. So um, uh, please um, um, uh, join me in welcoming Edward Simpson, who's going to speak to us today about State Highway 31, a road trip to the heart of modern India. Uh, I'd like to start by uh, thanking Gowry and Bill for inviting me and um, allowing me to speak in this seminar series. What I'm going to do today is give a talk rather than a paper. Uh, I think that's quite important from the outset to get our expectations right in relation to what I'm going to say. Uh, and I'll also say that I don't think I'm going to talk about anything that is particularly unusual. In fact, I think everything I'm going to say today is completely normal, mundane, routine, and can be found everywhere. It's just that normally people don't spend seven years looking for it, uh, which is what I have been doing. So in the talk today, I'm going to take you along a road uh, that is in Madhya Pradesh. The road itself is something of a heuristic device to allow different sorts of uh, themes to unfold as we go along. But the journey itself is also quite important because it's punctuated in various ways by different forms of extraction and different kinds of distraction as we go along the tarmac and it's those points of extraction and distraction uh, that I think really do take us to the heart of modern India. It is also the case that this road heads to what is literally the heart of modern India, which is a place called Nagpur uh, in northern Maharashtra, which um, some political enterprises have invested a lot of money in promoting as the heart of modern India, and have erected a monument in Nagpur called Mile Zero, uh, which is the point from which everything in India should be measured. Uh, this is a political contrivance, but not, I suggest, an incidental one. Uh, and we'll come back to mile zero uh, much later on. So as Gowrie said, this, uh, this project is, this talk is part of a bigger project. And I don't think the fact that it's part of a bigger project really matters for what I'm going to talk about today other than to say that the question that motivates the bigger project, the question that the European Research Council decided to give me the two million euros on the basis of is, why is there so much road infrastructure being built in South Asia today? That's my very simple question, uh, and that's the simple question that's oriented the last five or six years of, of my life. Now, you'll probably all be thinking, well, there are lots of reasons for that, obviously, uh, and some of the reasons I will share with you, you've probably already anticipated, 
but I would like to think that some of the reasons that I'm going to present as we go along the road are rather counterintuitive, counterfactual, and perhaps a little bit surprising uh, in a different sort of way. So when I started this project, I had divided the material into an on-the-road section uh, in the tradition of sort of Jack Kerouac and ethnography. Um, if we were literally going to think about life along the road as it unfolded in different sorts of ways. The people who lived there experienced the tarmac, felt its materiality, its divisive forms, uh, and so on. And then we had a bit that we called Off the Road, which was about the institutional networks that allowed roads to come into existence. Those of politics, those of development organizations, those of banks, those of lobby organizations, and all of those kinds of organizations that fill in the gaps of that world. But as I've gone on with the project, I've felt the on the road and the off the road parts of the project collapse into one. And it's that oneness that I want to try and convey uh, as we journey along the road. So instead of thinking there's a local and there's something bigger, uh, I'm an anthropologist, so that question of what's local and what's global preoccupies a lot of my colleagues. But I want to try and suggest that actually what happens along the road is part and parcel of the other scales of things that I'm going to talk about. So towards the end of the talk, when we're swirling around the world at 100 miles an hour, that is actually the same as nomads going along the side of the road. I want to try and to say that the local and the global are not really that separate in this particular instance, and they're brought together by very particular kinds of networks. And those networks will be very familiar to some of you, the networks of uh, political parties, of internationalist organizations, and an alliance, frankly, of big business and political parties. So in many, of, many of those things will be well known to you. So, when I talk about roads quite often, people think I'm going to talk about infrastructure. Uh, so if you came to listen to an infrastructure talk, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but it's to talk about roads, which I think are quite different in some key ways. There are lots of signals and noise in what I'm going to say. There are lots of other ways in which I could draw upon uh, the anthropological literature on infrastructure. I could think about roads as metaphors for political processes or for power. Um, some other colleagues have thought about infrastructure as a way of uniting uh, sort of politics uh, and anthropology of materiality with an anthropology of finance, perhaps looking at speculation or future forecasting or trying to think about the temporal politics of infrastructure, to think about the promises of infrastructure, uh, and I'm paraphrasing all the books I can think of on infrastructure as I go through this, this list of keywords. It's not really going to be about any of those things, but you will see uh, references to scale and to friction, which are ideas that come out of the sort of modern anthropology literature, thinking about infrastructure. Um, but you might also see some other ideas that don't sit that comfortably with modern social theory. So one of the problematics I have set myself, and I would also set you uh, as you're listening to me, if I may, is to what this story, how can you explain the story I'm about to tell using the conventional tools of social sciences and humanities? I don't really claim to have the answer to that question. But I think it's an important question. Obviously, there are bits of theory that are well known that you could draw in at any one point. But in terms of trying to theorize the, the story overall, I struggle to find um, social science that's going to help me do that. And I, I suppose, in a nutshell, why I struggle with this material is that the kinds of things I grew up reading seem rather out of date when confronted with the story of State Highway 31. The final caveat is that I chose State Highway 31 more or less at random, and I didn't know that scratching away at the tarmac in the way that I have done would reveal the story 
that it has revealed. So if I can move to the next slide. Man's eternal wanderlust led him to make tracks, first on foot, then in animal-driven carts over cart tracks. Man's ingenuity led to the evolution of motor transport and the need for better roads all over the world. Under the British Raj, attention was paid mainly to roads of strategic importance. Then came independence and with it the emphasis on unifying the country. The government committed itself to the mammoth task of developing and maintaining the arterial link roads which came to be known as national highways. From a sketchy network in 1947, rapid progress was made and the total length of the national highways today stands at over 29,000 kilometers. They are now becoming increasingly popular for carrying heavy and long distance traffic. So far, an amount of over 8,000 million rupees has been spent on their development. In addition to widening these roads to two lanes, basic deficiencies have been removed. All improvements are aimed at securing fast, smooth and uninterrupted travel. Widening of highways to two lane roads will not only accommodate the rapidly changing size and character of traffic on them, but will also help reduce fuel consumption and transport costs. Such roads have been constructed even through tricky mountains. National highways today span the length and breadth of the country, connecting state capitals, major ports, industrial complexes, and places of tourist interest. Some heavy traffic road sections near major cities and industrial complexes are being widened to four lanes, and this is being done without interruption to traffic. Wayside amenities like truck parking lots, petrol stations, rest houses and roadside eating places are also being provided. The Central Road Research Institute, Delhi, is playing a vital role in the research connected with highways. Experiments are being conducted to improve the quality of roads and a number of low-cost techniques have been developed. Mechanized road construction has led not only to good riding quality roads, but quick execution longer life and reduction in maintenance costs. With the increased traffic on national highways and the need to provide more links, the old bridges proved inadequate. We built not only a vast network of highways, but also constructed a number of major bridges, on an average about 60 in each planned period. We have already completed over 300 bridges 
on national highways all over the country. Some of the major bridges are the Vashishta Bridge on the Godavari in Andhra Pradesh, the bridge over the Ganga at Baksar in Bihar, and the bridge over the Narmada in Gujarat. Many more bridges are under construction, like the Kalva and Kasheli bridges near Bombay and the Kali bridge in Karnataka. Due to constraints on resources, a fee is being imposed on major bridges for a limited period. This will not only help recover costs, but also provide for reinvestment in the construction of other bridges. The smooth flow of highway traffic was often obstructed by railway level crossings. This was soon remedied by the construction of overhead bridges. Efforts are constantly being made to keep the wheels moving swiftly and smoothly over deserts, difficult hill tracks, through plains, and with little interruption through areas affected by natural calamities. To facilitate interstate travel by road, the government has introduced the National Permit Scheme. Under this scheme, a transport registered in any state of India can travel unhampered all over the country. Hoardings along the highways are a distraction to drivers, often leading to accidents. Fast and safe traffic cannot afford such distraction. Serious attention is therefore being paid to this problem. Frequent access to highways is a constant danger to through traffic. Industrial establishments set up near national highways on the outskirts of towns and cities have led to the mushrooming of shops, hotels, tea stalls repair works and patrol pumps. This is known as ribbon development. This kind of development poses certain problems. For example, the local traffic mingles with the through traffic on the highways, thereby interrupting their fast and safe movement. The frequent stoppage of buses emitting exhaust fumes leads to air pollution. Parking of vehicles along the road obstructs traffic. To prevent such ribbon development, the government is taking a number of steps, like removing encroachments on national highways, constructing bypasses and parallel service roads to ensure safe and uninterrupted traffic. The highway is for speed, the speed of progress. Economic prosperity, social development, industrial growth, and the unification of this vast and beautiful country depend largely for their sustenance on these, the arteries of our land.
So you have to imagine now that I'm a 1970s uh, voiceover for a films division. Uh, this is a fantastic film about the history of road development in India. And like many of the films division films, it contains a spectacularly simplified narrative uh, of a very complicated story. So here, because of man's ingenuity, he's invented mobility and he's suffering from wanderlust. So he's invented carriages and things to move along rough dirt tracks. Uh, eventually, uh, along comes the motor car and roads begin to appear uh, to satisfy the increasing desire for mobility. In the colonial period, roads were military and strategic until independence when, for the first time, the Indian government began to think about roads as a way of networking the nation, of bringing the country together by using tarmac, connecting places as a form of regional integration. Then came the national highways. Now, they don't say this in the narrative, but there's a story here about the importation of American highway standards into India, which gives the highways a particular formation. This was the network in 1979, and the government faced many challenges and overcame many obstacles to build uh, a new infrastructure that would carry buses and trucks towards a new form of prosperity for the nation. There, I think I did that even quicker than the, <laughs> the, the, the film. Right, but the point of this film, which really is a fantastically good film, is made in 1979 uh, and is so subtle and contains so much hidden information. I'm not a film scholar, but I, I can read so much um, from both the narrative and the pictures. Right, stop, stop. Okay, now this is a sign of where we're going to next, but we're not quite there yet. Yes. So roads from 90, roads in India played a particularly odd role in the national development story because throughout the 19th century they were not a priority of the colonial government at all. As you all know, it was railways that the British were most interested in expanding and networking and thinking about national integration and resource extraction through road, through railways rather than roads. Roads were always left to local authorities, to princely states, to local governments of different sorts of kind. So there was no network really to speak of. Financial arrangements, standards and things were haphazard across the country. That was until uh, 1943 when the first meeting of the Indian Roads Congress took place, not coincidentally perhaps in Nagpur, uh, which is, as you now all know, where mile zero is uh, in the center of India. So roads have been associated with Nagpur ever since they became a national political issue, which is very important in the story. Gandhi and Nehru used to speak very often of the Royal Road uh, as a political project. The Royal, the Royal Road in their language was sometimes the old Silk Road, sometimes it was Mughal Roads, but at other times it was the road to socialist development, it was the path to freedom in different kinds of ways, and for both of them it was the path, the road to development was the key metaphor. So from the 30s into the 40s and 50s, this language of roads being synonymous with both freedom and development were at the heart of political enterprise uh, in much of India. So the point there, and without going into too much detail about it, is that roads have played an important role in the political imagination of post of the independent state of India for a very, since its inception. Roads have been the, one of the barometers to measure development, political progress, and however jingoistic and however, however much of a political game those ideas about connectivity might be, as you all know, roads are very powerful symbols of electoral success, of political prowess, uh, and claims made to infrastructure, not only in India, but across South Asia, are one of the surefire ways of building a successful political career. The gentleman here, uh, Nitin Gudkari, is the current minister for highways, roads, waterways, telecommunications, and just about anything else that moves. Uh, and he was born in Nagpur. 
Thank you very much. You see where this is beginning to go already, I think. So, at the meeting of the world, the IRF, which is the International Road Federation, which is one of two global lobby organizations for the construction of roads. The other one is the World Road Federation. This is a, an annual meet conference of lots of lobbyists and investors and people who are interested in roads. And if you don't know much about roads, this world might surprise you a little bit, but lots of people travel around the world, get together and talk to each other about why more roads should be built in a particular place. And they use increasingly sophisticated modes of justification as to why this should be done and why this is good for everyone. So at this particular conference, to give you some examples, uh, Renault was there promoting uh, the world's cheapest car, uh, which in India is called the Renault Quid, um, because it costs 3,000 of them, I, I think. But a car that costs 3,000 pounds has a fantastic potential to change popular mobility in India. It's also, incidentally, the world's most dangerous car, because to produce a car for 3,000 quid, something has to give. So in this case, it's the quality of the metal and all the bits that hold it together and all of that sort of stuff. But this conference was headlined about road safety. So the, the, the chairman of Suzuki uh, stood up on the stage and said, you know, the way really to stop the 150,000 people that die on India's roads per year, 150,000 people, that's mm. quite a large number of people, is to get them all off those dangerous two-wheelers and get them into four-wheeler Suzukis, because that will reduce the number of accidents. So as you can see, there's a lot of lobbying. Uh, this, this, and some of the arguments that it made for roads are particularly convoluted and really serve corporate interests. However, Nitin Gadkari, who opened the conference, uh, he turned up three hours late because he got stuck in traffic, um, said at the beginning of his talk that uh, India was suffering from a small pollution problem. That was the week just after the public health crisis in Delhi had come to an end last November, when people stayed indoors because they couldn't breathe. And um, although anecdotal, rather than blaming the Punjabi farmers, I think it more fair to blame the Delhi motorists uh, for the smog cloud. Anyway, Nitin smiled at that one and went off with his speech about how we needed more roads in India and how public-private partnerships were a particularly attractive vehicle for foreign investors, those people gathered before him in the room, to think about developing roads in India. At the same conference, the World Bank also issued something called the World Mobility Report, which was a report compiled by different government organizations from around the world, which assessed the state of mobility as a development paradigm in many different contexts. It's a very interesting document, and it's because it's written by different agencies, the World Bank editorial team were not quite able to remove the voices of dissent from bits of the report, because the report is about promoting mobility as a development paradigm, as an economic form of organization. But it's also about a way of organizing politics and the future of the planet, mobility. One of the authors, whose voice was not completely sanctioned, questioned the idea that maybe endless mobility was not particularly a good idea if you also thought about global sustainability goals. And those two would lead to quite conflicting sorts of development trajectories. So that's the, that's the context into which the story I'm about to tell you fits. Where in India, the language of development has changed from Nehru and Gandhi and the roads to Nitin Gudkari standing up with his own political platform, talking about public-private partnerships to a global audience. So this is a very different world of roads to the films division uh, development of the highways kind of narrative. Okay. Oops. Now we have too much volume. Could we reduce the buzz? <laughs> Sorry. So this is a map for people who like maps. This is only the second time I've given the talk, and the first time I gave it, somebody asked me, well, why didn't you provide a map? I didn't think a map was very important, but here is a map. So we are 
Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, uh, Ratlam is here, and the road I'm about to talk talk about, thank you Bill, runs through Ratlam from about here to about here. So we're quite close to central India, and then just over to my left at the bottom here is Nagpur. There's even a, a, a close-up map with Jaura at the top, and we follow the road down to the south to Ratlam, which is often thought of the railway junction at the center of India, a uh, place of romantic songs and steam trains passing in the night. And then it comes down further to this junction here, which is, co uh, is called Labad, but Labad doesn't appear on the map. Labad is essentially a, a steel town. And for those of you in the room who came to listen to Jaura, I'm going to leave Jaura very quickly uh, on a four lane highway, the SS31. And the first thing you know about, you notice about leaving Jaura is the astonishing amount of truck stops there are to the south of the town, one after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other. Uh, just within the municipal limits. As soon as you leave the municipal limits, they stop. And these uh, truck stops uh, serve food. Uh, they're also places of sex work. And you can also score opium there quite easily if you're into that combination of things. Truck drivers like this combination of things and this particular sort of uh, uh, truck economy that is developed to the south of Jawara, I think it's fair to say is there to make this particular road more attractive than other roads in the region. So the people who run the road have turned the road itself into a kind of commodity where truck drivers are given a choice. They could take the Bombay Agra route, which is a bit better, or they could wiggle through the back and uh, end up um, in Jawara. It's still a four lane highway, but as you join the road and as you begin to leave Jawara, you realize you are in the middle of India. There are trucks from all over the place from the northeast, from the south, from Gujarat, from West Bengal. This is really India on the move, but it's mostly a truck kind of um, thing. There aren't many cars, there aren't many leisure vehicles. This is really trucks. This is about um, logistics and it's about truck kind of commerce. And then as you move further through this territory, Uh, to Rutlam, you begin to realize that there are other things at stake at the side of the road and life at the side of this particular road. There are different sorts of things going on. The opium itself um, is interesting and in some ways defines this region. The area is called Mawa and that was key in the colonial government's relationship with this part of the world because of the opium. When the colonial government realized they could sell this opium to China and the Chinese preferred it to the Bengal opium, I don't know the differences in taste, but anyway, the Chinese preferred the Maurer opium to the West Bengal opium. They began to infrastructure this area, to put in roads and rails for the first time in the 19th century in a way before that the region had been forgotten. So the routes then took the opium out to Bombay, to Karachi, and then into the Indian Ocean. And Amitav Ghosh has written nicely about that that traffic and, and the way in which central India was opened up to western India, counterintuitively, for a trade with China. But the, so the opium is sort of key in, in many ways and it's still one of the largest regions of licensed opium production in the world, but of course licensed opium produces unlicensed opium and leakages. Uh, and whether that opium travels with the bodies of uh, pilgrims who have died or whether it's transported by truck drivers or as the newspapers often described by the Muslim gangs of Ratlam, uh, it reaches Bombay and it creates other sorts of, of networks. But this area has also been very important for the RSS. This was the RSS, the Rastriya Swayam Sevak Sangh's first network. After Rutlam, Christoph Jaffalo describes this beautifully in his PhD thesis from all those years ago about how the RSS opened up different um, offices in this territory. So the RSS has also been very strong in networking in this region. So there's opium, there's the RSS. In Rutlam, the church is burnt down periodically. And there's conflict, for those of you who know India well, between 
the RSS between Christian missionaries and, to do, and the tribal populations also inhabit both sides of the highway. So if you like, the, the road passes through many of the issues that animate politics all over India today. We're at the sort of cutting edge of these sorts of things, and that might be the case in every part of India, but in Mawa, if you scratch, it's quite visible, and it's quite clear that these are not peripheral forces, but the organizing forces that keep this region going. Now, I can't do the voiceover for this because this is a toll booth and there's supposed to be a lot of truck noise and beeping and engines revving. So if you can just imagine noise in a toll booth in the middle of the night to give you a sense of what these places are like. To the south of Rutland, there are two toll booths and these now become the, the key points of extraction and pause and distraction on the rest of our journey. This is the first one. In this toll booth, we learn something of the political economy of running a public-private partnership road in India. In the state capital in Bhopal, the people who run public-private partnerships either in the Public Works Department or in the MP, Madhya Pradesh State Highway Road Development Corporation, tell a story of how they were the pioneers of public-private partnerships in India. I think other states tell a similar story that they were also the pioneers, but in MP, they're particularly proud of their pioneering status. That in the 1990s, the first public-private partnership road opened, then progressively into the, into the 20th century, PPPs became the way of organizing infrastructure. Government paying half, private investors, or not half, but private investors taking on the concession agreement for a toll road for 25 or 30 years, depending on the road. Now, they were so excited about public-private partnership movements in Bhopal that the engineer of the state describes them as a social movement. You imagine public-private partnerships being described as a social movement, but in MP they were seen as that, as a way of liberating infrastructure from an inefficient government, from a public works department, and turning over new forms of infrastructure combined with the liberalization of land acquisition laws, compensation packages, and things like that. This was a bonanza, really, for getting roads built. So, public-private partnerships were also promoted in many different ways and by many different organisations as a way of getting business done. Uh, the UK, in particular, invested very heavily in helping the Indian government set up public-private partnership um, organs within the state governments in Madhya Pradesh, uh, Orissa, Bihar in particular. They, went, they, th they thought this was a form of bilateral aid and essentially restructured the government so they could work on public-private partnership agreements. And it became quite mad throughout the early 2000s. And the World Bank also had promoted infrastructure as an asset class, it calls it, from the late 1980s onwards, something you could invest in, which in India came a little bit later, but that promotion of infrastructure as an asset is also part of this particular story. So in these toll booths, the concessionaires essentially take control of the tarmac for a 25-year period. It's in their interests to promote road use to get as many people to drive along this road as possible. Thus, perhaps, Jaura and the truck stops you see around it. They also have to provide a private ambulance service, which is quite distinct from the ambulance service that you find in the rest of the state, which creates a sort of two-tier uh, ambulance access network. They're also places of increased surveillance. All of this is CCTV, which then passes to a control room in Bhopal and another one in, in Mumbai. Vehicle uh, number plate technology, uh, you can tell, some friends of mine did this app 
where you can cross-reference -ref the number plate with other forms of publicly available data, and you can instantly find the name of the person who owns the car, at least, uh, from your computer, presumably here. Uh, so the incredible powers of surveillance and control that come with these two um, toll booths as well. So they're points where you have to stop and they're points of extraction, but they're also points of service provision. So you learn, for example, that the, that the concessionaire has to provide a fire engine. The concessionaire also has to provide a dog man who are often, uh, incidentally, Dalits who pick up the dog carcasses that get knocked over. You know, you see them blowing up on their backs on the Indian roads with their legs sticking up. So the dog man's task is to remove the, the corpses, the carcasses from the, the road to keep the thing flowing. But these are also quite violent places, toll booths. They're not nice, gentle places where you stop to have a little chat. They're heavily secured. The people who work there are behind grids, protected. And for those of you who are so minded on YouTube, there's a sort of sub-genre of films about toll booth violence. Uh, if you search in YouTube toll booth violence, you get quite a lot of it. And it's, it's essentially people with sticks beating up people who work in toll booths for many reasons. They had, they had the indecency or disrespect to ask a driver to pay the toll. But don't you know who I am? I'm not going to pay this toll. Uh, but also for many other reasons. There are fights recorded to do with potholes and ideas of people paying for a service that is not being delivered. So in a way, I think you see in these places a sort of a consumer economy of expectation and of service and of delivery where the private concessionaire takes the blame for um, disgruntled motorists who are, who are passing along the road. So here you see a little bit more. The, the don't honk sign is now wasted because the previous slide was full of honking. Uh, but as you can see, they are, there's, there's violence and there's security and there's also the dirt and the noise in these places that you just don't get from these kind of pictures. So then we've moved further down the road, away from Rutlam and further towards Labad, where we come to the second toll booth. And here I want to take you into the lives of those who work there a little bit more. They're incredibly disciplined places, where the people who work there stand in line and are lectured. Uh, the, there's the thumbprint, there's the, the security and the ID uh, for people logging on and logging off. They're incredibly rule-bound places that are run by a particular corporate ethos that I'll come to in a minute about what kind of country India is and what kind of place India should be. This is a place of standards, of targets, of accuracy, of punctuality. Shift, people who are late for shifts, for example, are punished. There's a lot of discipline in these particular kinds of places. We find now, perhaps, it's now, it's now time to say something about who owns the concession for this road. In the early 2000s, when the public-private partnership boom in India was really taking off, many companies who were in entertainment and media who felt falling revenue sales decided to diversify into roads. So there, one day you have a satellite TV company, uh, two weeks later you've got some roads. How do you do this? Well, Subhash Chandra, who was, is the owner of ZTV, uh, one of the largest satellite networks, um, describes in his biography, that I, I will call a biography because I presume he didn't write it himself, although it has his name on the cover. He says, well, we felt that revenues were falling in the satellite TV industry, so I phoned up my friend Nitin Gudkari and asked if he could arrange some public-private partnership roads for me in Madhya Pradesh. So he did. That's written in his um, biography. So it's not a conspiracy theory, it's about Subhash Chandra being friends with Nitin Gadkari and having the institutional capacity and government know-how to establish public-private partnership roads in Madhya Pradesh. And it is this company ethos of ZTV, of discipline, of future-looking um, India, 
for people like Subhash Chandra, the, the history of India, the po recent political history of India is slightly irrelevant. What's interesting is the future and the kind of citizens who are going to animate and motivate India in the future. So here, he is making modern India through the disciplining of the workforce. But it doesn't just stop there. This disciplined workforce then goes out into the countryside to explain to people who live in the villages near the toll route roads why they should pay taxes, why this makes a better India. So what starts as an infrastructural mission turns out to be a cultural one. And however improbable it sounds, the idea a manager of a toll booth touring the villages, telling, standing up and telling people why they should pay their tolls, is there and it's happening uh, in Madhya Pradesh. And this whiteboard was uh, his explanation. It's not particularly clear. It seemed magical in my mind at the time. He, he first of all, the manager of this toll booth, who I'll call Pramod, first gave me a lecture on why Britain had declined. And, and seeing that I was a relatively captive audience, decided to explain to me why it was that villagers should pay tolls. And this was the flow diagram that he drew to explain why it was that people should pay tolls. And he was passionate and he was committed to the idea of going out into the villages and proselytizing this message, essentially to promote the idea of privatized infrastructure uh, as a form of national development in villages in India. So I hope you can see that we're beginning to move quite a long way from the films division and Gandhi and Nehru and five-year plans and highways, all of which was unfortunately a bit lost in the films because I had to do the voiceover. But we're, we're moving towards the point that I want to get to on the journey of this road. There's, there is surveillance and there's discipline. And people who, are pu people who work there are punished and is docked from their wages if the tolls, the, the cash they hand in at the end of the day does not meet the CCTV records. People who fall asleep in toll booths uh, working there are woken up by a magic voice that comes from Bhopal to tell them to wake up. It is a surveillance world that these people live in. The people who live in the toll booths are, interestingly, however, all from local villages. So they are caught in this battle of negotiating tolls, uh, free tolls, passes, concessions, local politics, but they're employed because they know who is who and they know who is going more likely to start a fight and who is not going to. All of the managers who stand up in the villages are not local. I don't think you could be local uh, if you had to stand up in a village and give a lecture about why people had to pay tolls. Right, now the story moves a bit faster as we hurtle towards the southern end of the Jawara Labad Road. I've already told you that uh, Z Infra, which is actually called SL, which has headquarters in Mumbai, has the greatest share of this road, 75%. The other 25% <coughs> belongs to a company called uh, India Infrastructure Limited. And I thought it would be very interesting to find out what happened to the toll money. So the truck drivers pass through these two toll booths. It cost them about 450 rupees to do this uh, 125 kilometer stretch of road. So it's not cheap. If you imagine it costs 400 rupees for every 125 kilometers you're traveling, if you're traveling from north to south, you're spending a lot of money on moving your trucks on this semi-privatized infrastructure. It's a big business, in other words. So the story I'm about to tell which will probably take about three minutes, uh, it took me five and a half years to research. It's been very slow, um, uneven, but I think it's a story worth telling. So India Infrastructure Limited um, have the, the first front of that company that the toll money encounters after it's been placed in a bank in nearby Indore is in Mauritius, the first offshore uh, tax haven that the money goes to. And there's nothing particularly surprising about that. Much of India's offshore money goes through Mauritius in, in various ways. But then it passes through uh, the Isle of Man, which is much closer to my neck of the woods, which I've learned that if you happen to own luxury jets, you can get a very good deal in the Isle of Man. So you might want to 
you know, if you ever have a luxury jet, do think about the Isle of Man as a place to register it at least. Now, in the Isle of Man, there are offices of somewhere called India Infrastructure Limited. That's the full name of the company. It's a shell company. The Isle of Man is a tax haven. It's an, another offshore banking place. Uh, and the names of the shareholders in that particular company are all listed on their company reports. They're all named. The company produces an annual report which describes the profit and loss of this particular road in Madhya Pradesh. But from there, the money passes through something called the Alternative Investment Market, which is part of the London Stock Exchange. It's the unregulated part of the stock exchange that is regulated by gentlemen's agreement. Uh, and it would have been quite nice to have connected the uh, nomads who started off the talk on SH31 to the gentlemen who regulate the alternative investment market in the city because they are also called nomads. They're called denominated advisors. And they're called <laughs> nomads. If you go for a drink with them, they are called nomads in the pub after a day's work. Now, these guys specialize in tax, in the global circulation of money and tax. And after the money passes through the alternative investment market, of the London Stock Exchange, it then heads further west and through the offices uh, of a well-known firm called Alman Cordero Galindo and Lee Trust BVT, who you may dimly recall from the Panama Papers, which were leaked. And this particular firm of lawyers played a very prominent role uh, in, in the money that was disclosed in the Panama Papers. So I managed to trace this. I'm still going on my sort of uh, excavation of where this money is going to. And I got as far as the British Virgin Islands and Cayman Islands and a firm called Barnet Holdings Limited. Now, as a Londoner, I was very excited by this because Barnet is also a borough in the north of London. And I thought, wow, wouldn't it be extraordinary if this council had invested all of its pension deficit anxiety into a piece of highway in Madhya Pradesh. And if you use Google to follow this story, it kind of makes sense. Barnet Holdings is one of the most neoliberal parts of the country. It's privatized all of its public services. Journalists, uh, Aditya Chakravarti, who writes for The Guardian, uh, constantly points out that if you have to pay a parking ticket in Barnet, you have to phone someone up in the southeast of England. Uh, if you need your window fixed, you have to phone up. To, it's all been privatised. So it's sort of fitted. But after a few Freedom of Information requests to Barnet Council about whether they had holdings in um, a couple of the firms that I've not yet got to, they said no. This is not us. We don't have this particular investment. So I got stuck. Barnet Holdings Limited registered in the Cayman Islands. Uh, but then they decided to sell one of their luxury yachts. Phew. So to do that, they had to take out a classified advertisement. You know, you have to sell a yacht somehow. So they took out the classified advertisement, uh, which is not that. It is that. So they were selling a yacht called the Clifford II, uh, and they wanted 18 and a half million for it. And I thought that was interesting. These truck drivers on the State Highway 31 are keeping this yacht afloat in the Mediterranean. And you might all have yachts, I don't know. I didn't, I don't have a yacht like this. So I was quite surprised to learn that they have to have their GPS turned on and you can get an app on your phone which will tell you exactly where in the world the Clifford 2 is at any one point. So you could see it going backwards and forwards between the south of France, Sardinia, and the coast of Italy, in a sort of triangle. And then because they were trying to sell it, they had to replace the, the, the people who worked on the yacht needed to find jobs. So the chief stewardess who worked on this yacht put her CV on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And thus I was able to phone her up, invite her out for lunch, and ask her about which kinds of people used the yacht and um, amazingly she told me and it was the people whose names appeared on the original India infrastructure limited in the Isle of Man 
So these people have, they own the share of the road in Madhya Pradesh. They own the company in Mauritius. They own the company in the Isle of Man. They own the bit, the company registered in the alternative investment market in London Stock Exchange. And they own the company in Barnet Holdings Limited. So they seem to own all of these companies through which this money was passing. So essentially they were just lending themselves money uh, in one sort of tunneling exercise. And it turns out that the people who own, who own the money for ultimately after the global circulation of money has, has done its thing are part of a Tamil diaspora in the United States who live in California and Ohio. And what these people have in common is they all used to work for ZTV in their younger days, or for Essel Infra, which was based in Bombay. So they all know each other from this um, office in Bombay, where Essel Infra functions from. Now, I think that's quite an extraordinary story and shows in quite a concrete way how public-private partnerships have opened up India, in Indian infrastructure investment to a whole series of different networks, forms of power, motivations, and different kinds of governance that has got very little to do with a development agenda at that level. So when you hear in India that roads are all about development, it's about bringing people into a, a network, connecting them to the metalled road network, of bringing mobility and choice into people's lives. And Nitin Gadkari speaks about this often, as does Narendra Modi, incidentally. I'll, I'll digress. Um, Narendra Modi recently gave a talk in London. And he said, what is development in India today? Speaking in London to a Gujarati audience. He wasn't speaking to UK politicians. He said, development in India today is the government providing roads, electricity, water, job done. That is what development is. It's about opening the country to a market to provide basic kinds of infrastructure. And Modi opened that particular speech by talking about his time as chief minister in Gujarat and how the very first lesson he learned, he said to his uh, audience in Gujarat in London, was how important roads were to people. And roads, in a way, have become a form of the Gujarat model, a kind of good governance. And now he, now he's in, the cent in central government, continues that. But Nitin Gadkari has taken this to a new level. Nitin Gadkari has turned infrastructure into front page news. He's in, I, I know too much about this guy. I've followed him for five years and read every press release that he's, he's given in that time. Uh, and he talks, he gives hundreds of interviews where he talks about how many roads India is building, how development is coming, how beautiful his roads are, how he's beautifying some of them, putting in trees and all sorts of musical fountains in one near Delhi he was talking about recently uh, that you might have seen. It's extraordinary. He's really managed to captivate and motivate people with roads and infrastructure in particular. Now, the final sort of twist in this story, and that's to bring it back from the British Virgin Islands into India and to Nagpur, is that the story of Nagpur is not particularly well known and is not particularly well, it's not repeated in the Indian press very often. But when Nitin Gadkari was still a state level politician, he was given a rather unusual sounding post like special minister for Nagpur uh, in the government of Maharashtra. There aren't many other states that have that nomenclature. Uh, but he became special minister, while at the same time he was known as Mr. Flyover in Bombay because of the amount of flyovers he was building. Now, for a long time, he's had a plan to develop Nagpur into the road center of India. I think it quite extraordinary that the largest teak market in India is in Nagpur. If you imagine how far the teak has to come from Myanmar to get to Nagpur, that shows something of the power of this vision that he has for turning Nagpur into a road distribution center. Now, my Barnet Infrastructure Holdings people 
Um, oh, I missed out one nice detail that you might appreciate. That the registered office is in the Yamraj building, <laughs> which, is a, which is a detail that I couldn't let pass. <laughs> It's, it's too nice of a detail just to let slip. But anyway, Nag, Nagpur becomes the centre. And it's now, from Nagpur that the RSS networks up into Madhya Pradesh emanate from. It's from Nagpur that this investment in roads emanates from. So Barnet Holdings Limited also invested in distribution warehouses around Nagpur. So the, the fact that the distribution network road houses and the road are attracting the same kind of investor all through the same sort of network I think reveals the power of looking at infrastructure anthropologically because it reveals all sorts of other networks that are otherwise rendered utterly invisible the kinds of connections I've talked about today are not easily found they're not easily made and they're not easily found or made because they're not supposed to be. They're disguised, and that, in a way, is the whole point of the, the shift of money and that sort of thing. So I don't know really quite what to do with this material, whether to turn it into a discussion of transparency and corruption, transparency at the grassroots level, where World Bank kinds of uh, putting documents online takes your direction in a certain way while actually money is being tunnelled in a fantastic way um, from the Virgin and Cayman Islands into India. Or whether to do something else with it, to think about the ways in which the nomads, the nomads at the side of the road, the nomads in the London Stock Exchange, the nomads after all who were floating backwards and forwards uh, on the Mediterranean on their boat, whether to bring these nomads together in some sort of poetic um, combination to think about the different sorts of movement that a road in India actually provokes. These people are connected, but they're connected through what? They're connected through my research questions, perhaps, and the networks created by my research. So I suppose I'm left with thinking about what kind of world it is that I've actually just spent the last 40 minutes describing to you. I'll finish there. Uh, yeah, Phil? I have, to, I have to jump in, first of all, with a little bit of background, which is my first year in India was spent in Nagpur uh, oh. <laughs> uh, in 1964-65, at which time Nagpur tea was, of course, grown in and around yeah, the yeah. area, which yeah. established the market. But that nobody worried about that. It was the orange market that really mattered. Uh, secondly, I've also heard Mr. Gadkari speak no mention of roads at all. He was into liquid roads in that speech. That is to say, his river development uh, thing, which is an interesting and uh, reviving the Ganges as a, as the super highway. Um, yeah. He's also, I think, for those who don't follow in politics, much spoken of as a, a possible future prime minister in case uh, Modi somehow falls flat on his face. So that that. And, and a final little thing about nomads, in a village near Nagpur, at the house of a very senior person in the RSS, I woke up in the, in the, in the, uh, in the middle of the uh, summer with a uh, Rajasthani nomads with their camels and sheep. In, the, in this village, three miles, three hours full of cart ride away from the nearest railway station. Uh, and they were in camp there where they had, in, at night, they passed through their sheep to the manure, and in the daytime they gave, gave the children in the village uh, camel rides. And that's how they, so that particular flow, that was in 1965 uh, that this was going on. So I feel very much in tune with uh, this uh, particular, particular thing, uh, and I can't I can't claim to have traveled the same routes, but I think it's uh, it's crucial. So 
I don't really have a question. I just felt I had to knock <laughs> that on. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. It's nice. It resonated. It yeah. resonated everything. Well, that's nice um, to, to know that what I've just said resonates with a, with a vi visit that predates this field work by 40 years, um, which I think is, is fantastic. Uh, so you're right that Gadkari speaks about lots of other things other than road development, but roads really are his favourite. So when he first when he first became when he was first elected when he first after he was president and then he joined the central government, he developed this habit of announcing two or three times a day how many kilometres of four-lane highway were being built in India. And that, the use of statistics there really sort of got me. He started off by saying, oh, it's three kilometres of four-lane highway per day uh, is being built in India. But by 2050, uh, we want that to rise to 50 kilometres per day. And he began to think about well, what was what would happen on all this highway? You know, wh wh where was it all going and what was it all for? Um, but now, now he's up to about 32 kilometers per day. So he's, the, 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 the statistic is going up and up and up. And th there's something about the way he uses numbers and the way that he uses comparison to infrastructure that is incredibly seductive, I think. I mean, roads might not be the, you know, they, they don't really appeal to me. I used to be an anti-road protester. But the roads do appeal to lots of people, and he is really, I think, completely on message. And he's got into uh, a very popular and populist version of development by the way that he, he uses it. Um, and I think the Nagpur Teak, it's, it's a very nice uh, image of Nagpur Teak now being Myanmar Teak, which speaks of another. Uh, flow and, and oranges. But I, I think that the story about Nagpur, it's called Mihan, his vision. It's like one of these, like as, as Modi has attempted in, in Gujarat to build a, a modern city out there, in, his is called uh, Dolera, to build a city out of nothing. So, so Gadkari is building this Mihan place. And into it is being sucked all of this investment in land uh, which is, is invisible unless you do this sort of work because a lot of it is offshore. And as I said right at the beginning, I, don't, I, I think what's interesting about this story is that it is utterly unremarkable and probably for lots of the land patches around Nagpur you could tell a similar story with similar kinds of investors. It might not always be as neat as this one, but I think Nagpur is going to become or has become a very important place in thinking through infrastructure. And as, as, as you suggested, uh, as he's, it's said he could become prime minister, he's also being let off the leash a little bit in terms of what he can say. So he is not only talking about roads now, he's talking about you know, anti-cow smuggling vigilantes, he's talking about national political issues. Uh, and, and if you watch him, as I suspect you might have done, you can actually see the way he talks and the way he thinks about himself in relation to the country changing before, before our eyes. But the roads are part of that very important network for the anti-cow um, vigilantism, yes. isn't it? Yes, um, absolutely. Is there a question? Yeah, it's a comment. This was fun. Uh, I know that stretch of road better than any stretch in India. I ride it all the time. I can't wait to talk to you more about it. <laughs> Um, uh, I have a question. Have you heard of Lothan Baba? What is that? The ruling saint based in Lothan. Yes. He's, he, right, because his whole claim to fame is going on these rolling pilgrimages for peace on the roads of India, nationally. So yeah. is he somebody that you thought, he's the perfect it just makes sense to me now why he's from Red Lam. and I'd always sort of wondered if he was sort of RSS adjacent, yeah. and now it just seems like he must be, right? Yes. It's like national unity by rolling on the roads. He rolls up to Vaishno Devi and yeah. tried to roll across the border to Pakistan. He's your metaphor, isn't he? Yes, you, absolutely. I've not, I've not met him, but the, one of my research assistants has met him. Interesting. Yeah. So is he... So, what's his, in, in a different sort of talk, right. uh, I mean, 
to, to think about him and to think about the role of pilgrimage in relation to this road yeah. and how religion uh, of particular kinds becomes public on this road in certain sorts of ways, yeah. not only to Jaura mm -hmm. um, but to other temples in, in the region in August. Uh, where all the pilgrimage camps crop up and the whole road changes complexion. It's another way of thinking about the relationship between religion and infrastructure and networks, which I think would be a really interesting thing to do. It's possibly not this talk, uh, but an important one. And there are also a couple of fantastic stories. Maybe you can picture the place. Um, just to the north of Jaura, there's a big temple in the middle of the road that was, that was submerged. Yeah. This, is, this, this has a potential to become quite a specialist conversation, so I'm going to resi resi resist <laughs> I, 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 that I, I, I temptation. But religion and tarmac and vigilantism, I think it's all there in this story yeah. as well, yeah. without much analytical stretch. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. I, thank you for this uh, very entertaining and interesting talk. Uh, Go back to your question which you started with that why are so many roads being built in South Asia and the story which you ended up telling, uh, if we look closely, education, health, other, oil, electricity, we can find similar patterns uh, in most sectors. There is a great amount of investigative journalism being yeah. done, people are being killed all the time, RTI activists, etc. So where, where do we end up on you know, going on that road? Uh, where do we end with roads? Uh, in terms of analysis of thinking about how these infrastructures are coming up, there is a certain cultural and political transformation of aspiration, of movement, of number of cars that have multi, I don't know how, what's the yeah. multiplier of in the last two decades. Uh, so it's, it's, if you are wondering about that story, as well, apart from this one, which is very interesting, uh, but coming from Delhi, coming from uh, CSDS, having uh, heard the broader neoliberal argument about what's going on for so many years, is, is and financialization, of course, being the new yeah. addition to it. Uh, what is what is going on apart from this? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I hope you didn't hear me use the word neoliberalism in that talk because I don't think this is about neoliberalism. I think this is about other things uh, and to focus on neoliberalism spoils a lot of the, the content of it which is decidedly unliberal. This is about networks, this is about kinship, this is about some very conservative forces uh, at play and it was those that I really wanted to emphasise rather than to talk about the, the neoliberalist part of it. Um, but in, in road world, which I've inhabited for the last five years, there's a there's statistic that people like to bandy about. Is that it took 100 years uh, to get the first billion cars on the road, and we're now halfway through the decade that it's going to take to get the second billion cars on the road, which is a truly horrific sort of statistic if you do worry about the relationship between infrastructure development and, and climate change. Uh, and it's, as my opening slide suggested, there is a lot of big business interest in this story. Uh, but, there's, but there's also very mundane interests at the heart of it. And there is RSS. The RSS network is a key component of this story. The ESSEL, uh, former employees of ESSEL Infra, are a very key part as is the Tamil diaspora that, that emerged from it. So I didn't want, it, I really d deliberately didn't do it in terms of neoliberal governance and World Bank structures and things like that. I tried implicitly perhaps to, to push it a little bit beyond uh, a neoliberal kind of argument. But then what I would like to do if I had another life would be to take up your question about, well, what, what does this do? What does this leave us with? and to try and map other parts of that road network and to see what other patterns of connection there are to be found from you know, the adjacent toll road or what happens when you get to the next piece of this toll road which is owned by a different <coughs> concession and how are those concessions <coughs> related or not 
to one another. And then, then I think you could be, you, it could become a really interesting political project. At the moment, it's just been a very time-consuming anthropological <laughs> project, <laughs> frank, frankly speaking. Uh, and, and that's it. And I'm also aware um, that co your colleagues, my colleagues, our colleagues at CSDS have also done a lot of work on this and similar sorts of issues. But I do think roads are distinct from the other kinds of infrastructure that you group them with. And I think they're distinct, not only analytically, I mean, they're, dis they're distinct in terms of policy worlds, but they're also distinct in terms of political currency. I think that, that you know, the idea of Gandhi and Nehru and Gadkari talking about the road to freedom, the road to self-reliance, it's not only in India, of course, that these metaphors ring true, particularly true in the United States as well, that they, are, they have such deep political and cultural currency in a way that building an electricity grid just doesn't quite have, have the same pull. Because people can, as you say, imagine themselves and can aspire through infrastructure. And if I read around your question correctly, there is a lot of literature on infrastructure and aspiration and hope and the future and all of that sort of thing. And I can see why that literature exists, but I don't think this story is that literature. Um, I think there was a hand. Uh, there's, uh, yeah, so yes. Uh, thank you. Um, I have uh, one brief uh, additional data point on Nagpur and then a question. Uh, I had the pleasure of visiting Nagpur in 1969 on a college year abroad program. <laughs> and one thing I remember, this was almost 50 years ago, there were no direct airline flights. Nagpur really was the center of India. Every airline uh, went from the metros, went from Madras to Nagpur, Bombay to Nagpur, Calcutta to Nagpur, and on the tarmac, they exchanged mail, cargo, and passengers to get from one place to another. At midnight. I'm sorry? At midnight. <laughs> at midnight, yes. I don't know why it was at midnight, but you're right. It was in the middle of the night. Oh, I knew it well. Yeah. Always. Yeah. It was just remarkable. Anyway, uh, so Nagpur was the heart of India 50 years ago. My question is, um, you, you looked at Highway 31 in great detail, and this is a fascinating story. Do you have any sense of the other public-private partnerships and where the, the funding is coming from, and specifically whether any of it comes from this enormous amount of capital that's sloshing around Asia from the China world? And I don't mean yeah. Belgium Road, I just mean private capital. Yeah. Do you have any sense of, of that? Yeah. I didn't know I would be talking to so many old Nagpur hands. I, I, I might have been a bit more respectful to Nagpur and given it a bit more history and placed it within a regional movement and so on and so forth. So I apologise for any shortcuts uh, I may have taken for Nagpur and also recognise its uh, historical importance as an airline centre. <laughs> uh, but it is the case, perhaps, that Nagpur doesn't have that role uh, as an airport now, so roads make a sort of nice uh, substitute for that, that former network. Now, your, your question is, is a really interesting one, and it's the one that I really wish I, had, I could answer. Um, I've not come across... So in a, I've not come across concessions owned by... Uh, Chinese companies and Nitin Gadkari who we keep coming back to this man often speaks about the attractiveness of Indian roads to foreign investors it's just it's not true all of these pieces of infrastructure are loss making activities apart from well this one isn't um, for some of the reasons I've described so all of the public-private partnerships that the government of Madhya Pradesh set up at the beginning of this century have now collapsed and have now been taken over again by the state at a loss to, this, to the state. This is, a, this is for the state-level highways anyway. And he has spoken in London not very long ago about trying to attract uh, pension firms to invest in India infrastructure and he just cancelled a trip to Canada to speak to pension investors there. Uh, he cancelled it because he was worried about future leadership of the party, incidentally, so he couldn't do it. But, but the fact is that they don't attract a lot of foreign investment because they're not profitable. 
Even the really busy ones are not very profitable. So the story I tell, this road, it does make a profit. It's not an enormous profit, but it does make a profit. But why it's profitable is because people can make money disappear into it. So that's essentially the story that I'm telling about this thing called tunneling, about global tax evasion, where you come to your nomad in the city of London and say, look, I've got $100 million. Uh, can you make that disappear for me? Which is essentially what they do. So it passes through all of these things into this road in Madhya Pradesh. The share price, incidentally, is, of this is worth nothing. The more money that's gone into it, the less the share price is worth. So it's a way of lending yourself money and always losing out. And that's called tunneling, I think, is this specific word for it. So although, but that would only work if you have a trustworthy network of further employees who have access to other offshore um, tax havens, like uh, Yamraj, house, you have Yamra's <laughs> building, uh, and you have people who are based in California. Uh, and now just to go off tangent a little bit, but to carry on answering your question, I stopped the story with Barnet Holdings Limited in relation to that road, but actually Barnet Holdings Limited have all sorts of other infrastructure investments, largely in South America, uh, to do with solar and wind, all of which are loss-making, subsidised state activities. And they are to do with making vast sums of money disappear. So it, this is not about China, or well, it's not about anyone investing yet in Indian roads as profit-making activities, it's about a financial vehicle for doing other things and that that to me is what's so interesting about this story uh, and perhaps also explains why I can't answer you about who invests in other roads just because to get to this level of detail has taken me a very long time and has been very methodologically difficult and although I tell the story entertainingly I, I hope I did anyway it's not been an entertaining story to uncover and it's actually been very hard work to do that job it's also a very bleak story. I mean, I was actually struck by um, almost the sense of despair, you know, at this kind of the, the, you know, the counter movement where, you know, as you began talking about Gandhi and Nehru, the sense of the road is opening up possibilities. And here is there's the sense in which the road becomes like a disappearing act, you know, dis leading nowhere. So I actually found something very, very bleak and despairing in, in, in the story. Yes, I, I share that bleak and despairing sense of it. I, I find it bleak and despairing, I think, because I'm interested in climate change. That's one form of bleak and despair part of the story. Um, so some other colleagues who've written about infrastructure and the sort of privatization tend impulse that I've described have called this um, the privatization of the commons, which is quite a provocative way of looking at it. You know, that what was once common infrastructure has been privatized. Or slightly more provocatively, uh, as, as an activist called Nick, Nicholas Hilliard uh, has described this as a form of licensed larceny, mm -hmm. which is a, a more provocative way of looking at it. But positively, and I think genuinely, quite often these forms of road infrastructure do make people happy at a very local level. And I don't wish to sound glib about that at all. So thinking about research that I've done previously in Gujarat on post-earthquake reconstruction, talking to people who, were, who felt a genuine sense of happiness and a state paying attention that they were building road, big roads in their neighbourhood. The fact that some of the architecture of the road is exclusionary and cuts villages off through gates and fences and walls and essentially creates a private corridor passing through the heart of Madhya Pradesh is, is a bleak story. But if we think about the finance model of that road, it's all about promoting more mobility, more trucks, more cars. That is the finance model. And therefore, that aspiration that people have to, mo to mobility and to cars feeds into the finance model of the road itself. So you wonder, really, in a way, where the aspiration and the governmentality and come from and who is governing who through that through mm -hmm. that sort of infrastructure. Uh, we have a couple of more questions and maybe you can take uh, um, two or three more. I wondered why you would poo-poo 
pre-1947, because I think they're possible lead-in, and uh, I immediately thought of Kim, of Frederick Kipling's uh, Kim, where the Grand Trunk Road is the connector of India. And also, your story is also about a network of roads which connects India, makes India a nation. Yeah. So I, I would sort of ask you not to dismiss what goes back to the Mughals, comes yeah. through the British, as a road which is a connector and, and makes India a nation, as does the story that you have been telling. Yeah. Thank you for that question. It gives me an opportunity to, say, to, to talk about another aspect of this research. So this, this particular road was a military road uh, in the colonial period. The same route, it had dak bungalows and camping grounds all the way along it. So it clearly has a, separate, a, diff, a longer history that was to do with the opium and the cantonment uh, in in central India, the military cantonment in central India as well. But it was parallel to the great Agra-Bombay trunk route, which was the axis of, of connection for, for this part of the world. So I think what you see here is a sort of provincialization of some of those networks of, of connection. And I really didn't mean to poo-poo the history at all, because I think the history, see, Nagpur and history, I should have been more careful about both. That, it's, that the history of it is actually really important because the, the battle for infrastructure, for Rutlam becoming the centre of the railway, for Nagpur being the centre of the roads, previously air and now, now roads, is the animating story in some ways of that region and the ways in which people thought about it and thought about it in terms of its relationship to other parts of India was in terms of connection and in, the, in this case opium and military intervention rather than toll revenue as, as we see today. But it was also the case that before uh, the 1943 meeting in Nagpur that a lot of the road infrastructure around here was deregulated and really haphazard. So the states of Jaura, Rutlam and all of the others had their own systems of tolls and network which led to a very sort of piecemeal set of arrangements in this part of the world. So I, I take the point completely about the Grand Trunk Road and the role of roads in older forms of connectivity, but I will stand by the point that railways were more important yes, in the colonial grand, imagination grand. and that roads did not really become a national project until 43. Uh, yeah, Jack? I was going to ask kind of a version of uh, what Lenny just spoke about. And it's just an open-ended question. It has to do with Delhi and the CSDS and all that. So how, how should one think, against the background of the particular road that you've talked about, how should one think, for example, about the Yamuna Expressway that's been built uh, from Delhi to Agra now with, of course, connecting points onward and so forth? Is it a different kind of uh, infrastructure, to use that word, that uh, is involved um, I'm concerned about that road actually and some parallel ones to it. I just wonder how, how you see that against the background of what you said. Uh, certainly, it's a, certainly a, a private yeah. public thing. I don't really know very much about JP, but uh, notable for various things, including the building of a, uh, a big race horse stadium along the way. I mean, there's a lot that could be said about it, but I just wonder how it seems from the perspective of what you've described, particularly yeah. about financial infrastructure. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know so much about that road uh, so that I could answer the question in, in detail. Uh, but one of, the temp one of the tempting things t when you're thinking about this sort of infrastructure is to think about the corruption of it and the contracts. Uh, and, and the Yamuna Expressway has been discussed in those terms to do with the allocation of contracts and materials and that sort of thing. But that's quite different to the story I'm describing because actually the contracts were not, they're not such a big deal. The stakes are not that high in all of these sorts of things. And I think the Yamuna Expressway is a ratcheting up of the intensity of infrastructure. It's a much bigger project than the one I've been describing. You know, it's, it's ambitious, it's not used very much. <laughs> 
Um, and it, that seems to have a different sort of ambition to it. This is a provincial four-lane toll road that is not a kind of headline-grabbing piece of infrastructure. Whereas the route is just... But I thought you were uh, intimating that, uh, apropos of the RSS yeah. and Nazi, that there's something more than, uh, something metaphorical yeah. that's to be learned uh, for all of India in relation to how this work came. Yeah. Well, the golden quadrilateral mm. plugs into that because of Mr. Yeah. Kanduri and the rest of the place. Yeah. So just to be clear, uh, I see where the question's coming from. Just to be clear, I think what, what, what I tried to do was to show quite implicitly was that an RSS network that has been established in Marwa for 70 or 80 years gives people who control this particular piece of infrastructure a political clout within the region to determine where particular kinds of truck stops are opened where illicit substances can be procured or not to create a particular kind of market for this piece of infrastructure. So my story was quite local in a way and the RSS network facilitates the, the promotion of this piece of infrastructure in very particular kind of ways. I wasn't explicit about that in the talk for reasons that I hope are, are obvious. Um, whereas, whereas the piece of infrastructure you're talking about is, is a massive, ambitious, headline-grabbing kind of thing that I think is in some ways of a different order and perhaps a bit less successful uh, as a project for those people who've promoted it. So far, just a, it's just a, uh, an anecdote which may be just hmm. completely adventitious, uh, fortuitous. Um, the investment of Indira Gandhi in... Uh, in the, in the refinery that was built at Mathura is, of course, along National Highway 2 on the mm. other side of the So in sort of local parlance in Vrindavan, that is associated with the Congress as a sort of major enterprise and with the, inf the introduction of all sorts of what you would call truck stops, um, complete with sex trade and, and, uh, and uh, yeah. oh gosh, workers coming in from uh, from the Soviet Union, initially now no, Russia, and uh, just uh, liquor, all of those things that uh, that you mapped onto that road, I mean, are they recognizable in this part of the country too? It's just that they happen to be uh, located along a different and rather more local road. So yeah. actually the Yamuna Expressway provides quite a contrast to that sort of road uh, as mm. it's been built by a different set of local forces. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah, very evocative. As, a, as an image. So th there, there is, as you might be able to imagine, political competition along this road. Uh, and there are some nice pictures of Congress sponsoring one bus stop and the BJP the other. You know. all, of that, all of that sort of is there. But almost, I, I feel as if this story that I'm telling is a bit beyond party politics, in a way. This is about chief ministers of state uh, colluding in the distribution, and it is a collusion, it, and it's not me making this up. It's about the public distribution of a, of a commons through public-private partnerships that does seem to transcend, in a way, political boundaries between particularly Madhya Pradesh and Maharashtra which where the key actors all seem to to belong and, and to share interests actually throughout the region which is which is a region that's you know loses a bit of its identity because of the modern state boundaries between MP and, and Maharashtra but clearly is a region that had a lot in common and is is unified by all sorts of other networks of which the one I've described is is the latest version. Well, I think you know we've run out of time, but uh, we will have the reception next door, so maybe we can continue the conversation there. I would, I'd really like to thank um, Edward for this really interesting and sort of far-ranging um, talk. So I think one of the things that really struck me, uh, you sort of put a lot of pressure on the word infrastructure, but I saw that you know these little that, you know, things like the toll booths and these kinship patterns that you were sort of focusing on. In some ways, they become the infrastructure structure of, of this kind of reorganized uh, world. In fact, they seem to even take over the road as the site for thinking about um, uh, infrastructure, particularly the toll road, which I would love to hear more about, because it seemed to me that that's, that's an entire book in itself. Um, but um, thank you so much, um, Edward, and thank you all for, uh, for coming. Please join us.
us next door. There is a small reception. It's really fascinating.